maybe we can start with the good news saying to the people on the line that uh, we got the article that you're going to be listened to featured this morning by Eric Topol. For us, it's a privilege and honor, and we're very proud being Topol, the father of precision medicine. Or at least one of the father of precision medicine. Right, shall we start, Simona? Yes, let's go ahead. So welcome everyone. We are really happy to see already so many participants. Uh, for today, we want to introduce and give a brief explanation of our paper uh, titled Sex and Gender Differences and Biases in Artificial Intelligence for Biomedicine and Healthcare, recently published by Nature Partner Journals, in particular Digital Medicine. We will have four speakers today, Antonella, the CEO at WBP, Davide, advisory board member at WBP, Silvina, executive committee member, and myself. We will also have on the line, um, uh, as you may already have seen, uh, some of the co-authors, and so they will uh, actively participate in the Q&A uh, session, but we will introduce them afterwards. So if we go to the next one. Good. The agenda for today is uh, structured in uh, four sessions. We will first uh, have an introduction about WBP for those of you uh, who are not familiar with the organization and with, with our work. We will then move uh, to the types of sex biases and health data sets introduced by Silvina. Then we will have the section around AI technologies and recommendation presented by Davide. And finally, we will have enough time um, to have a Q&A with the participants on the line. It's a pleasure for us to, to introduce our work um, also because it started uh, um, already a few years ago and it started uh, uh, by looking at biases in, a, um, in a, a real life examples. So then uh, uh, Antonella started to develop the idea and um, uh, Silvina and uh, Davide led the work and developed it further uh, till publication. If we go to the next one. Good. Uh, just to give a bit, bit of introduction about myself. Um, I'm Italian, you can easily tell from the accent, I guess. I'm a vice president at WBP uh, since last year. Uh, my primary job is a, as a life science consultant at Accenture based out of Basel. And uh, by background, uh, I have actually a mixed background because I'm a PhD in computational chemistry, but I also studied marketing. If we go to the next one. So what is WBP about? For those of you who don't know about the organization, we are a non-profit organization. We have a global presence. We are based out of Switzerland, but we have a broad network. We focus on sex and gender determinants of brain and mental health as a gateway to precision medicine. To do so, we focus our efforts on four strategic axes. The first one is basic science. The second one is clinical science. The third one is socioeconomic risk factors. And finally, emerging technologies, where uh, the people on the line, especially Silvina and uh, David and myself, are a part of. Um, it's important to know that uh, we also have a variety of activities. And if you want to hear more about our work, um, we re highly recommend to join us for the upcoming International Forum on Women's Brain and Mental Health. This is a conference uh, hosting a variety of people from regulatory agencies, from pharmaceutical companies, from academia, and is happening every year. This year will be held in September 19th and 20 in uh, Zurich. If we go to the next one. Good, so what makes WBP really special is the fact that we have uh, a broad team. You can see the picture of uh, almost all the team members on this slide. And um, uh, we come from a variety of different cultures, backgrounds, and disciplines. Uh, for example, medicine, neuroscience, psychology, but also people coming from a more business background. And we work together with caregivers, patients, um, and uh, policymakers, as well as other stakeholders um, uh, in the uh, healthcare sector. If we move to the next one. We have been uh, growing over the past uh, three years. Um, it's actually quite impressive that uh, we managed to build a global presence, as I said, and we are present on, on all the uh, main social media platforms. 
So we have two LinkedIn channels, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, but we are also featured on a lot of uh, international journals such as the Financial Times, La Repubblica, The Independent, and uh, we regularly do uh, TEDx uh, uh, presentations on the topic. When it comes to publications, uh, Uh, we uh, have uh, published and continuously publish on the main journals such as Nature's MPJ Digital Medicine. But it's also important to say that we do uh, a variety of uh, activities on the side uh, that are uh, really uh, for the general audience. For example, we regularly publish uh, blogs on our we website as well as do these webinars which uh, are uh, open to everyone. If we go to the next one. So after a brief introduction of the organization, I will pass the word to Silvina Catuara Solars. She's executive committee member at WBP, mostly working on the technology work stream. As a daily job, she's a strategy manager at Telefonica Innovation Alpha in, based out of Barcelona in Spain, and her background is in biomedicine. Go ahead, Silvina. Thanks. Thank you so much, Simona. So if we go to the next one, So, as you said, Simona, uh, the main key focus of the Women's Brain Project is to understand the sex and gender differences in health and disease. And as you all, uh, people that are in this webinar, are very aware, aware uh, during the past decades, there has been a great progress on development of many different types of technologies based on artificial intelligence that are going to help us understand many different differences, uh, inter-individual differences among uh, people, including uh, sex and gender, and how they affect uh, health and disease. Uh, one of the main uh, premises that we state in our paper, our recently published paper, is that actually all these uh, AI uh, technologies can act as a double-edged sword. And what we mean by this is that If these technologies are developed without removing sex and gender biases that exist uh, in the world, uh, they can actually magnify and perpetuate some inequalities and stereotypes that exist. And on the other hand, uh, maybe a more useful part of this uh, sword is that if we develop these uh, technologies in a way that it is much more Uh, accounting for sex and gender differences, they can even help us uh, to the promotion of more tailored and precise, uh, not only prevention uh, approaches, but also diagnosis approaches and therapeutic uh, approaches. So in this sense, uh, we had to be very aware since the very beginning of the development of these technologies so that we can maximize uh, the benefits for them. And I feel that uh, Having that said, everyone would agree on that the most, uh, let's say, ideal types of artificial intelligence systems would be the ones that are able to reduce or even avoid stereotypes and discriminatory uh, biases regarding sex, and also are going to be those that are going to help us to distinguish among individuals that uh, in, in terms of how their vulnerabilities for disease are, and also how we can maximize the treatment outcomes considering these uh, sex and gender differences. And even so, most of the artificial intelligence systems that exist uh, so far do not account for uh, sex bias detection or uh, ignore, in fact, uh, sex and gender differences. So if we go to the next slide, uh, another uh, take home message that we established in our paper is that in fact, not all the biases and all differences are bad. Uh, in fact, in the context of uh, precision medicine, uh, differential consideration and differential treatment considering biomedical aspects is the necessary uh, take, uh, it's a necessary action to be taken And uh, in this regard, uh, we distinguish uh, the undesirable biases from the desirable differences. And uh, in this uh, sense, for example, uh, within the generation of biomedical and clinical data, an undesirable bias would be just to collapse all the sex and gender categories into only one, 
and to assume that the findings or the results from this experiment could be extrapolated into all the categories, which could be just uh, misleading and driving to wrong conclusions, while a decidable uh, difference in this regard of generation of biomedical and clinical data would be to differentiate between the different sex and gender categories and to examine these differences so that then the results uh, are coming from representative data sets. On the other side, in the sense of the implementation of clinical findings and artificial intelligence models, an undesirable uh, bias would be to, for, for example, prescribe a one-size-fits-all treatment to everybody, regardless of the differences that have been found in terms of symptomatology and mechanisms of disease, which can lead, uh, in fact, to not only secondary effects, but also reduced uh, treatment outcomes in some groups. And on the other hand, a desirable difference in the implementation of clinical findings and results would be quite the opposite, meaning uh, to prescribe the tailored uh, treatment that is specific and accounting for sex and gender differences and would maximize uh, these benefits in terms of health. And the, the interesting thing is that, in fact, the artificial intelligence are able to both, uh, on one hand, reduce the undesirable uh, biases and, on the other hand, to maximize and enhance these uh, desirable differences that we are all uh, targeting uh, with, the, my, with in mind the, the whole precision medicine uh, approach. The thing is that in order to really uh, achieve this, uh, the first step is to identify those undesirable biases and to mitigate them. So if we go to the next slide, uh, an area where actually we have a lot of undesirable biases is that of the generation of biomedical, clinical, and digital data. Uh, in fact, it has been shown that, uh, for example, across the preclinical and biomedical data that mainly is done either in uh, cell cultures and mainly in animal models, uh, for example, with mouse models of disease, Historically, it has ignored the sex factor, and it has been mainly done with male uh, mice for reasons of convenience. Uh, now we know that up to 73% of the behavioral phenotypes are driven by sex factors. And because of this, there are many more uh, balanced uh, data sets and many, many more balanced uh, experiments that are done in both uh, female and male mice, but there's still quite a long way to go in order to achieve uh, full uh, representative data sets in this regard. In terms of uh, the clinical trials involving actual human patients, in fact, there is also a very strong undesirable bias uh, a very interesting study uh, published by the FDA last year in 2019 that was uh, examining um, worldwide clinical trials uh, of different type of therapeutic areas found that in fact uh, women are uh, underrepresented in clinical trials and one particular therapeutic area in which this uh, underrepresentation of women is most uh, striking is that of cardiovascular disorders. And in fact, it has been shown that in this therapeutic area, women account only for the 34% of all participants in clinical trials. And another uh, interesting aspect is that cardiovascular disorders are not only uh, showing that women are underrepresented in terms of treatment and assessment, but also there is a strong underdiagnosis because actually the symptoms and the signs that are shown with uh, uh, people are uh, having a heart attack or a myocardial infarction are different if they are women or men. Pay attention to this because afterwards uh, you're going to be uh, wary for, for this. Uh, and then we move to the other, the other aspect that uh, we have here and we have surveyed in our paper that is the field of digital biomarkers. Digital health uh, is in general uh, a very early but uh, fast growing area that is uh, basically uh, in this case uh, getting and extracting 
health-related uh, data from digital devices that we use in our daily basis, such as uh, smartphones and wearables. And this uh, type of health-related data is very useful, particularly for neurological disorders that are uh, finding the small fluctuations across time uh, very relevant in order to uh, see the treatment outcomes uh, and, and so on. But in, interestingly, what is uh, found in this uh, field as well is that uh, many of these uh, early stage studies of the digital biomarkers do not account for uh, sex and gender differences. And in fact, there are many more males that are being as, uh, assessed in terms of the accuracy of these digital biomarkers. So overall, uh, in summary, if we would like really to get going with artificial intelligence uh, and accounting for sex and gender differences towards precision medicine, we need to get robust data sets that account for these uh, sex and gender differences. Uh, so now uh, over to Antonella, the CEO of Women's Brain Project that is going to start with the first poll. Yes, uh, thank you, Silvina, for the kind introduction. And we are waiting for the poll. This is a, a question that relates to symptoms of a heart attack experienced by a woman. So we would like to know from you in the audience which might be the typical symptoms of an heart attack, ranging from shortness of breath or pain in one arm, rather pain in both arms, nausea or vomiting, back or jaw pain, and finally chest pain. So according to you, which is the most likely possible type of answer? Thank you. I can see that people are voting. Just give them a few minutes. We cannot vote, right? No. <laughs> mm, so you cannot check whether I'm a good doctor or not. <laughs> okay. The majority of people has just voted, so I'm going to end the poll. And that's the result. So oh, here we are. Actually, the majority um, highlighted that the uh, most uh, uh, common symptoms it is shortness of breath, and certainly this might be true, but there are also uh, other types of symptoms that are depicted here, such as nausea or vomiting, of course, chest pain, and uh, eventually even back or jaw pain. So it is very diverse. It's ranging from one side to the other. And this might lead to the type of misdiagnosis that Silvina was uh, pointing at. So thank you so much. Now I am uh, very pleased to introduce you one of the first author of this uh, paper, Dr. Davide Cirillo, who is uh, working as a postdoctoral researcher at uh, the Supercomputing Center in Barcelona. And he acts as a precious scientific advisor at the Women's Brain Project. So thank you so much, Davide. You led the work together with Silvina, and uh, the award is yours now. Thank you, Antonella, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, so in uh, our work, we surveyed a series of technologies that are based on different forms of artificial intelligence. And that like commonly share two main characteristics. So on one hand, they have the great potential to advance personalized medicine, which is largely supported by evidence from many research efforts and scientific literature. But on the other hand, they are also exposed to the risk of uh, incorporating and propagating sex and gender biases for reasons that are mainly linked to the generation and processing of the data uh, that is used for training the models and uh, also the way in which the final application uh, is uh, deployed and used in the, in the society. So in particular, we focus on the three technologies that you can see depicted uh, uh, here. So big data analytics, robotics, and natural language processing. Big data analytics includes all the computational methods that uh, use large volumes of heterogeneous data that we, humanity, produce uh, every day. And uh, for instance, in 2019, uh, we collectively produced uh, about 30 zettabyte of data, which corresponds to 30 trillion gigabytes. So really big data. So, but what is this data? So big data is social media, financial transaction, mobility, and of course, biomedical data. In particular, genomic data, so DNA sequences. 
And in particular, population genomic studies have frequently uh, been reported to suffer from a representation bias, meaning that in these kind of studies, women, as well as ethnic and other demographic subgroups, are not uh, equally represented uh, often. Robotics is gaining more and more importance in personalized healthcare, especially for the elderly and uh, for children. The interesting thing about sex and gender bias in robotics is that it's not only determined by the gendered appearance of the robot, which of course should not strengthen social stereotypes, but also by the sex and uh, uh, of the final user. For instance, in the health domain, it has been demonstrated that a sex difference exists in the acceptance of robots to support and relieve stress in hospitalized children. So this means that boys and girls do not react the same in front of a robot that in principle should facilitate their healthcare. So it's something that you have to take into consideration when implementing computer. Natural language processing finally addresses written and spoken human language. So we are talking about methods for text analytics and conversational agents like Siri, Alexa, and so on and so forth. So, and in particular for natural language processing, I would like to give you an example of how sex and gender biases can be transmitted from the data to the model. The model in question is uh, so-called uh, uh, word embeddings, which is very much used because it's a model that allows to represent words as numerical vectors based on the semantic context in which those words appear. So the problem is that if there is a bias in the documents that are used to train such model, this bias will be embedded as well. So for instance, um, non-definitional words such as babysitter would be often found in a semantic context related to the feminine gender because of historical and cultural reasons. And this kind of bias is so strong that as you can see on the uh, right hand side, there is a, a linear correlation between uh, the biased and gendered embeddings of uh, occupational words and the actual jobs that are occupied by women in our society. Uh, in our paper, we recommend, uh, we propose recommendations for the development of artificial intelligence in uh, precision medicine. So first of all, you have to distinguish between uh, desirable and undesirable biases. Or rephrasing this, you have to distinguish between uh, sex and gender differences and sex and gender biases. Then you have to increase uh, the awareness and knowledge about those biases, not only in the scientific and technological community, but also among policymakers and the general public. We advocate for also the usage and implementation of explainable algorithms. So to achieve a higher level of explainability and interpretability, uh, in particular when we are talking about uh, algorithms that are black boxes and uh, inintelligible to understand to humans. And uh, finally, uh, we of course uh, advocate for the incorporation of key ethical consideration during every stage of the technological development. So with this, I introduce the next poll in which uh, we are asking to you, which are the main types of uh, undesirable biases in artificial intelligence. So let's see, please vote. Okay, and here we have the results. Yes, uh, historical bias and representation bias, which are the two main biases that I also mentioned during my, during my, my talk. And, uh, but it's also true that all the others are different types of uh, undesirable biases that can cripple into algorithms at different stages of the life cycle of, uh, of an AI system development. So we have uh, biases in the way you measure things, biases in the way you aggregate uh, the data that then you can use for training or for 
uh, evaluating, for instance, you can have an evaluation bias in the golden standard that you choose, in the benchmarkings that you, that you implement. And then finally, of course, also a general algorithmic bias in which biases can be created in the steps that are inherent in the, in the algorithm itself. So thank you for, for voting. Now we can go on. Okay. So of course, all this work uh, would have been uh, possible uh, without the, uh, the, the great efforts and the commitment of uh, uh, all our co-authors uh, and uh, collaborators and friends. So, uh, well, I would like to uh, thank all uh, of you for this great achievement and, uh, and, uh, and this first step in, uh, in more and more collaborative works of this, uh, of this kind and especially on this, uh, on this topic. Actually, um, it's important to, to say that uh, um, the co-authors are in the audience right now and then uh, and that it would be like it, uh, now there will be like a session of Q and A's, so question and answer. And uh, if they want to intervene in order to, to answer to the questions that the others might uh, raise, um, of course, they, they are free to do that. Just raise your hand in the system and uh, Francesca will uh, give you the mic. So uh, let's go ahead. Let's, let's move on to the uh, Q&A session. So the question and answer, if you have any question, we are here to answer your question. Well, I think that uh, there are already few questions which are coming from the audience, Davide, and maybe I can get one for you. The question comes from Karen Gamero, and I hope I have been uh, pronouncing the name correctly. Uh, why do we at the Women's Brain Project use both the words sex and gender? If we can maybe give an answer, Davide. So, uh, okay, this one. The question is, what yes, do we mean? Well, actually, actually, yes, it's, um, we use it together in order to uh, distinguish them uh, clearly, especially in the in the in, in the in the manuscript, in the text of the of the paper. So those are two very different things. So sex is the biological sex. So it's uh, a feature of an individual that is defined at the chromosomal level. And uh, while gender is uh, um, uh, dictated by uh, society and the way you. Uh, see yourself and you represent yourself in the in the social context. Actually, there is a distinction between uh, um, gender identity and the gender expression. So the way you see yourself and the way you express yourself into in, uh, in, in, the, in the community. So of course, this um, like sex and gender might or might not be aligned. And, uh, and this, of course, is a matter uh, that has to do with uh, social roles and the stigma. And it's one of the main, not only the one, but one of the uh, major uh, sources of, uh, of biases, uh, especially historical bias in our, in our society. Yeah, then still another question for you, Davide. I think you're on the spot here. And uh, this is from Heinrich. Ogen Schmidt. Uh, again, I hope I pronounced the name properly. And uh, the question refers to the nature of algorithms, where very often the rules are not explicit as it should or, or as we wish. And the question from the audience, from the, from the person is, who, who would like to know is whether is there a way to facilitate the creation of algorithm with uh, fewer biases? So how can we mitigate these biases, which is the best strategy, and uh, one solution could be curating the data? Yes, one solution could be curating the data. Um, another solution could be um, to uh, render the algorithm as explainable and interpretable as possible. I totally understand that this is um, uh, oftentimes not possible, and this is why we distinguish in uh, um, we make a distinction between uh, so-called white boxes and black boxes. And this is because the, the models, uh, in the case, for instance, of black boxes are so 
complex that uh, uh, that are not intelligible for uh, for humans. So in this particular case, something that can be done is to um, leverage uh, explainability algorithms. So those are families of algorithms that operate on top of those uh, black boxes in order to facilitate the interpretation of what is going on. So uh, simplification, uh, try to achieve the maximum accuracy, but also the maximum explainability in your, uh, in, uh, in your machine learning approaches and the curation of the data and, uh, and, and, and yes, and development of uh, um, uh, methods for detecting and for mitigating in an automatic way um, those biases. Thank you, Davide. Then we have a question again from Karen Gamero, and she asks, uh, why are there differences between men and women? Well, I can try to give a very short answer saying that, first of all, it relates highly likely to the different um, um, constellation, which refers to hormones and uh, the way the hormonal um, impact uh, influence uh, the predisposition to have heart attack in men versus women. Other hypotheses might be the exposure to certain type of lifestyle and, uh, you know, uh, refer also to risk, etc. cetera. Um, but the real truth is that uh, still a lot has to be discovered. And now we have a question from Satish Babu. How much um, AI is already involved in drug discovery aspect? Um, so how much we use algorithms to do drug discovery? I go ahead. Uh, so basically, um, well, I would say that we have to make a distinction between uh, research and uh, and the actual, uh, uh, you know, path that uh, that the drug development will uh, uh, generally takes. So in terms of research, I would say a lot. So uh, there are there is like a lot of implementation and a lot of work uh, in algorithms and uh, methods predictive methods for um, uh, uncovering like candidates for for drug uh, for drug discovery for uh, candidates for candidates for drug targets and things like that um, of course like this makes up the, the base this is the basic research that then is used you know by the departments and the uh, uh, clinical trials organizers and things like that in order to uh, to then uh, pick interesting spots in uh, in all those uh, uh, in from all efforts. So in terms of uh, what is the impact of this, I would say, I would say a lot because it's really the, the, the basis. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if I may add uh, for the second part of the question, which is rather re related to the economic part, I think it depends on how you look at it, right? If you look at it uh, through the entire uh, life cycle from development to afterwards outcome for the, for the people. So yes, obviously it's a uh, uh, very costly, but then uh, if you look at the um, health outcomes in the in the long term, uh, um, you... I think this is where the transformation is very much needed. Also, in the switch in the mindset from developers as well. Um, actually, there is a question which might be for Silvina, and uh, it's about representation and historical biases. So the question from Silvia Garcia Cobos, it is uh, whether having this type of rep representation and historical biases, can we then use data set or are they not really helpful in generating a learning whenever these data set are analyzed by algorithms? Silvina, you're, yes, now you're yes. So I, I think that actually, uh, Mm, we should not disregard completely these data sets that have been created. The thing is that we need to be very careful in the conclusions that we draw from this analysis of this data, because knowing that there are some existing uh, biases in terms of maybe the unrepresentative uh, participation of women, uh, this means that whenever we uh, extract the findings and the, the information from those data sets, we need to consider that probably these findings could not apply also in women. They could in some cases, but in some other cases they could not. So this is kind of opening another question and maybe other data sets properly uh, collected should be uh, done in the future. 
Thank you. Thank you, Silvina. There is another interesting question um, that it's uh, very pertinent uh, from Rochelle Dinger McCord. Um, and the question it is whether the collection of data um, has an impact on uh, transgender women. So how can we make the best use of data to understand specific needs? And uh, yeah, so who will, would like to answer? I would say absolutely. I mean, this uh, is a very hot topic as well because uh, there is a full spectrum uh, on the whole sex and gender. It's not like a only binary. Uh, sex or, or gender and transgender is also a very relevant topic to do uh, research as well. So to your question, it will be very relevant, of course, to collect these data sets. I believe that there are some people in the world that there are some research uh, work stream being done in this uh, direction. I cannot give you the details, uh, but if you would like, we can get in contact and provide them later. Yeah, sure. If I if I can add uh, a couple of things, there are, that, that there are initiatives uh, that are just focusing on this. So on uh, how to collect the data and make it specific for for uh, the transgender uh, sphere. And um, the problem here is that uh, it's I mean it's really like an uncharted uh, area. Uh, so it's it's done so little in this uh, that uh, I mean it. it really like a, a source of, uh, of knowledge discovery in a way and it's really important to push on uh, on these aspects because uh, because of course i mean it's, uh, uh, minority subgroups that uh, uh, needs to be uh, equally represented and uh, and needs to be uh, uh, they their health um, uh, needs to be addressed as well Thank you so much, Davide. I see that there are some questions from the audience, um, additionally to those we tried to answer already. And uh, I would like to know whether the people would like to be unmuted and pose the question themselves. For instance, there is one question from Evas Basashti. I don't know if I pronounced the name correctly this time. And uh, in case, maybe we can open the mic and see whether Evas would like to pose the question. We will get some help from Francesca. She's uh, the register of the evening. So Francesca, if you can try to open this mic. Yes, I'm trying to open the mic. So I hope that now Heaven can talk. Let's see if uh, the person is still there. Otherwise, I'll read the question. If Basashi is still muted, I don't know if... Yeah, here we are. Is it, is it all right now? I hear a voice, yes. Uh, hi, hi, thank you. Um, thank you for uh, uh, answering. I mean, it was a great presentation and um, thank you for the presentation and for what we are doing. Actually, you know, my question was really, uh, uh, I think Davide mentioned it, that uh, the minority, but I was wondering, you know, I mean, within the women, there is also a different uh, uh, racial, I don't really like this word, but anyway, that. That's how we identify it, uh, then uh, white and yellow and black and so on. So I was wondering, you know, to get a better precise diagnosis or things like that, uh, does it make any differences, the racial uh, differences? Does it impact the diagnosis for a precise medicine or not? And uh, how do you overcome this question, this uh, because I mean, as I, I, I understood, there is not that many um, data uh, related to this, uh, uh, the, 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 that kind of uh, population. So how do you, how do you mitigate this? And, uh, I, might, I might try to give a first answer. And then of course, if uh, the authors would like to comment, um, that would be ideal. So uh, we at the Women's Brain Project, we usually, start from saying that sex and gender differences are considered for us like the getaway to precision medicine. So it is from where we can start to achieve that much needed precise approach to the treatment, to the diagnose, to understanding the disease. 
And of course, when it's about races, they certainly have a, an influence. And we all know that metabolisms change uh, among uh, uh, humans, such as, for instance, if you want to have one drug brought in Japan, you need to have a dedicated clinical trial to prove that the drug works in that specific population. But certainly, this is just an example of how a nation and an authority has decided to circumnavigate the, the problem for Japan. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, there should be a specific um, attempt also to address uh, the needs specific to other races. And AI will be certainly a possible solution by making sense of big data. Actually, we have one problem with genomic data, right? And maybe, Davide or Silvina, you want to comment on that when it's about big data set, genomic data set, there, for instance, there was a strong statement done from the scientific community, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Um, uh, big concerns, actually, because, uh, of course, the, the underrepresentation of, uh, of uh, subgroups in uh, population genomics studies. And so I'm talking about, for instance, uh, genome wide association studies and uh, studies that look for the association between variants and, uh, and gene in uh, cohort that are recruited and, uh, and created in, according to several criteria. So the underrepresentation of subgroups in this kind of study, of course, undermine the, the, the reliability or at least the, the, the generality of the insights, biological insights that you can get from, uh, from them. The problem, and that Eva was, uh, was actually also mentioning this, is that sometimes you don't have like the cohorts, you don't have populations, you don't have the data. So like the, the, the subgroups are minorities, so are, those are small. And it's very difficult uh, to, you know, to, 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 to have significant, uh, statistically significant uh, results uh, in such situations. And, uh, and sometimes you cannot even like apply um, machine learning or uh, deep learning or artificial intelligence in those cases. It is actually very important to stress out that there are um, approaches, artificial intelligence approaches, like for instance, transfer learning or other kind types of, uh, of learning, some also implemented in, uh, in the form of neural networks that allows you to analyze uh, minimal set, minimal data sets. So, and this is extremely impro important for uh, addressing uh, minorities, addressing rare diseases, and all the situation in which you have, you know, a, a problem in terms of few data, little data, you know? Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Davide. And uh, now my, my request will go to Angela Sekulic. Maybe she wants to pose a question and uh, afterwards I'd like to hear also comments from the panelists in the audience, whether they wanna add something to the discussion, excuse me, from the other authors in the, in the audience, not the panelists, sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for this uh, talk. It was very interesting to hear about uh, gender and um, sex aspects, especially in the artificial intelligence. My question lies in there, uh, more so to say, maybe even a technical one, but how would you minimize undesirable bias and at the same time maximize the, um, desirable differences? Wouldn't, um, will there at one point be an overlap or would there um, an algorithm, so to say, be confused in that way that maybe these desirable differences now start to be undesirable bias and other way around? Thank you. Who would like to take this question? Maybe Silvina or... Ivana? So we uh, commented on the chat, she would like to add to this question. Excuse me, Simona, I didn't understand. Apologies. Uh, Zoe commented on the, on the chat, saying that one, she would... We have one comment in the chat from Kusemori, and now I Zoe, am yeah. just... Uh, sorry about the pronunciation, and I have just unmuted her in... in Hi, Zoe. She... Welcome. Yes, yes. I, I wanted to contribute to the previous question. <laughs> So maybe we then do the following. We answer the question we just heard and then you might want to do a comment to the previous one. Sure. What do you think? Sure. Sounds good. So maybe Silvina, you want to take the, the question that we just uh, heard about how to, about desirable and uh, non-desirable -desire, biases? Yeah, also, um, um, it's a very good question. I think that, uh, so it's, uh, it's important to 
um, to acknowledge that this is uh, in general like a very early uh, type of uh, discipline. So I'm sure that there are no full answers to all these um, type of details. In terms of the technical aspects, I believe that uh, having like a, a bias uh, detection feature for the reduction of the undesirable bias should be uh, very relevant. And then for the um, desirable bias, I believe that the explainability of the AI would be the one that would maybe show whether the, the findings or the outcomes of these um, AI algorithms are showing uh, something that is uh, pertinent to the sex and gender fact, um, sex and gender factors or not. I don't know if David, you would like to add anything else on yes, that. Yes, maybe. maybe. Um, so basically, imagine that you have two groups uh, that can be, for instance, like like Silvina was saying before, not the the mice that are used uh, for the experiments. And uh, you can do you can perform an experiment in two ways uh, with those mice. Imagine you have a cage with uh, male mice and a cage with female mice. You can uh, perform the analysis in the two groups separately, uh, but at the same time you can also like mix them. And so essentially, if the results that you have from one type of analysis and the other are very different, you can have an idea uh, of the, uh, how bias can be. How bias can be uh, your conclusion in the moment in which you mix, for instance, the two, uh, the two categories. So from a technical point of view, I think that uh, uh, considering also like the, 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 the analysis, separating the, the, the categories can give you a hint on, uh, on the existence of a, of a difference or of a bias. So making this distinction. Thank you so much, Davide. Actually, I'd like to listen to the voice of uh, the other authors, if they are online. And now it comes to Zui and then maybe others. Zui, your yes. comment, please. Yes, thanks, Antonella. Um, so I wanted to comment on the earlier question about, um, you know, how, uh, how this would apply to um, uh, races and other women. And I just wanted to make a comment in addition to what the other authors have said. Uh, so in, in this case, it's also important to consider the socioeconomic um, factors. Uh, because you know many of these new technologies, especially with big data and digital biomarkers, uh, they are not cheap. It's it's very expensive to um, develop and use these technologies. So, for example, uh, many of the mobile health studies that have been done recently uh, have been done with iPhone users, and as we know, iPhone users are generally from a socioeconomically higher background than Android users, uh, and and so it's uh, it's it's completely possible that we you know end up uh, getting more data from um, people who are uh, socioeconomically uh, better off, or even countries which are socioeconomically better off, uh, which would also then lead to a bias in uh, in how we are interpreting the algorithms that come out of out of this data. This is a very valid uh, argument and concern, I think. And this is why we should try to advocate for the, capacity, the, the possibility to digitalize also the, I mean, the whole world, the whole planet, and give accessibility to, to these solutions. I mean, it's a matter of access. It's uh, yes. like with medicine, you know, it goes together. You have to empower people to access technology and uh, such as we can make sense of all the data sets and represent specific needs of the whole planet. Yes, exactly. Thanks, that's, that's from me. Yeah, uh, you know, what we are trying to say at Women's Brain Project is that maybe the day we will reach the precise medicine or the precise health, it will be the day when the word differences will be substituted with the word characteristics. This could be one way. I don't know, I'm not very good with semantics. I didn't study literature, but uh, <laughs> sounds a bit better. Let's put it this way. So I think we have another, La, maybe Laia would like to make a comment. So Laia, she's also another author of the publication. And yes. uh, hi, Laia, how are you? Fine, thank you. So uh, we, yeah, 
Looking I forward like to hearing. I would like to add that uh, there are many types of biases. In fact, uh, there are initiatives like the Catalog of Bias that has uh, analyzed uh, all the types of biases that uh, usually we can find on, on data. Um, algorithms should take into account uh, all these biases. And for that, it's so important that fair by design algorithms are designed. So there are several initiatives, uh, several algorithms that uh, try to be fair and this initiative should be encouraged in order to manage with this bias data. Thank you, thank you so much. I think now maybe, do the voters have a call to the, to the people listening? I mean, do you want to ask for specific help? Actually, I think we did not invite yet to our forum. Can that be? I'm asking Francesca, who is the person behind the Yes. storyline of the evening yeah here we are so um i just want to invite the whole participants to what is going to be our next forum which is going to be a virtual event which uh, will happen on the 19th and 20th of september 2020 so kindly book your agenda uh, we will be um, having the live webcast in Zurich, Switzerland, and we will discuss also to the topics that you've just uh, uh, listened about, you know, um, sex and gender biases in artificial intelligence applied to health. Um, the conversation will continue, of course, and we are also designing an hackathon um, to challenge the best minds on topics related to sex and gender bias to be solved before the forum and then presented at the forum. So. Uh, stay tuned uh, with our channels, uh, our media channels, because most of the time the communication goes via this uh, this 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 channel exactly, and uh, you will have a chance to learn more if we might need your help and how to participate in the hackathon or if you want to join our forum. Any question, any comment from the audience? We can open the mic. Also, just to say hi. After all, it's a chat among friends. We hope. So if anyone has a comment or a greeting to pose, uh, we're still here, or otherwise we slowly might say goodbye, as we're here since nearly one hour. We don't have further requests so far. I hope that the panelists enjoyed, and I hope also the people on the line have been happy with the discussion. Yeah, and if you're interested to know about our work even further, please just visit our webpage, www.womensbrainproject.com. And as I said, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And with this, I think we can slowly say goodbye. I, I want to thank you, the panelists, personally, first of all, for the nice conversation tonight, but mainly for the great, um, for the great work that you've done in achieving this success. We have now lots of People, I think, in the chat, or am I wrong, Francesca? Yeah, uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Ah, okay, thank you. Here we are. So thank you to Simona for the introduction, our vice president. Thank, thank you, you to the panelists, to the authors on the line, and uh, to our followers and supporters, and stay tuned. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice evening. Enrique Wolf. Hi, Enrique, nice Hi. to see you here. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Antonella, for arranging everything. No, you did, you did most of it. And uh, WBP is just a platform, so you are the actor. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.